Well, welcome to our Easter Sunday Church Online. My name is Pete, pastor here at City on a Hill, and it's a joy to welcome each and every one of you to our Easter special online service. So, welcome. And wherever you're joining from, whatever your background, where, whatever your journey in life, uh, my prayer and hope is that you will experience God in this moment as we turn to the Bible. Let's pray and ask that God will speak to us. Father, thank you so much for the Easter message. Thank you for the death and resurrection of Jesus, a message that brings life and hope to every person on earth. My prayer for my friends who are joining me today, that God, you'd fuel our faith, you'd open our eyes and help us to grasp the wonder of what took place 2,000 years ago, but still impacts our lives so profoundly today. Come Holy Spirit, help me to speak. Help everyone to hear in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so the Apostle Peter, St. Peter, was at the pearly gates of heaven and four Glaswegians turned up at the pearly gates of heaven and he sees them and he said, are you from Glasgow? And they said, yeah, we're from Glasgow. And he said, okay, wait here. And he runs off to God and he says, Father, God, um, there are four Glaswegians at the pearly gates. And God said, well, Easter happens. It means that the door is open. Anyone can come in. He said, okay, God. So he ran back to the pearly gates and then he ran back to God. God! They're gone, they're gone. And God said, what do you mean, uh, the Glaswegians? He said, no, no, the pearly gates. They've nicked the pearly gates. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm from Glasgow, by the way, just, just in case you're offended. Um, okay, forgetting the fix, fictitious Peter, the real Peter actually gives us foundation for our optimism. He tells us in his, in his writings that Easter is the very basis on which you and I can have optimism today. Optimism is hugely important. Having hope, having optimism is hugely important for life. Here's, here's some research that was carried out by a doctor, Martin Seligman. He wrote a book entitled Learned Optimism. And in his research, he's from the University of Pennsylvania, in his research he discovered that he points out that optimists do better than pessimists in everything in life. They do better in marriage, they do better in career, in sport, in education, in work, they do better in sales, they do better in the army. They do better in politics, they win more. In everything, optimists beat pessimists, except in one thing. And Dr. Martin Seligman said, the one thing that pessimists are better at than optimists is in perceiving reality. <laughs> but he then concludes his book by saying, it's, he goes on to say, it's better to be an irrational optimist because you have a better life, even though it's irrational. Now, I'm an optimist. But I want to tell you today that you don't need to be an irrational optimist. You can be a rational optimist. You can have a basis for your optimism. The famous atheist Jean-Paul Sartre, before he died, he was trying to fight off feelings of hopelessness and despair. And he said, he kept saying to himself, I know that I shall die in hope. That's what he said. But then he went on to say, he added, but hope needs a foundation. And the problem is he didn't have a foundation for his hope. And that's where I come back to Peter. Peter, speaking about Easter, tells us that Easter is the foundation, the basis of our optimism in life. This is what Peter wrote 30 years after the resurrection. And he wrote this to Christians who were about to face the world's worst persecution at the hands of the madman Emperor Nero. And Peter writes this book to help people have optimism even in the face of the worst persecution they've ever experienced. And this is what he says in 1 Peter chapter 3, sorry, chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter's saying, this is 30 years after the resurrection, he's saying, an event took place in history that is so colossal in its impact that it can give you a living hope, a basis for your hope. Not a wishful thinking, but an optimism based on fact. An event took place, the most momentous event in all human history took place 2,000 years ago in Ju Jerusalem where Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. Of the billions of people who have ever lived and died, there is one man who lived died and conquered death forever and through Jesus it unlocks something for the human race that if you have faith 
your life can be forever changed. Now, to understand why Peter's got this sense of optimism based on the resurrection, let me take you back in Peter's journey to his beginning. So Peter, three years before the resurrection, met Jesus for the first time. He was a fisherman on the shores of Lake Galilee. And Jesus appears to him, and this is what happened. Peter was fishing. He'd been fishing all night. He'd caught nothing. He wasn't a very good fisherman, okay? He caught nothing. And Jesus said to him, I want you to cast your net again into the deep. And Peter said, okay, we've been working hard all night and caught nothing. But because you say so, I will let down my nets. This is Luke chapter 5. When they'd done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. In verse 8, it says... When Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, from now on you will fish for people. So here's Peter. He's, he's, he's so, all of a sudden he's aware, this is not just a man. He's just caused us to have a miraculous catch of fish. And he was astonished. And in the sight of such a holiness, he falls on his knees and says, Away from me, I'm a sinful man. And Peter then goes on to spend the next three years of his life astonished. Not just astonished here, but astonished every time he saw a blind person seeing or a lame person walking or <clears throat> miraculous healings or people getting set free from demons or even people being raised from the dead. He saw it all and he heard the most marvellous teaching. And he sat on the edge of his seat. He had, a, he had a front row seat in the life of Jesus for the next three years, totally astonished, totally blown away. And then things take a turn for the worse. And then the night that Jesus is betrayed... Peter swears his allegiance to, to Jesus. He says, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And yet it was that night, that night, that very night, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus. When the rubber hit the road, when Jesus was arrested, when the threat of death was there, Peter chickened out and he denied that he even knew Jesus. And I think he probably had a flashback and he thought back to that first moment where he met Jesus and he said, away from me, I'm a sinful man. And he probably thought, do you know, Jesus, I warned you. I am not the, the, whole, the whole package here. I'm not the perfect individual. I don't know if I can make it. And here he had, when it counted most, <coughs> he denied even you, Jesus. And then the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. How <laughs> incredible. He conquered death. Now, what would you do the day after the resurrection. Jesus is risen from the dead. What, what do you wake up the next morning and say, okay, I'm going to do this? Well, this is what it says in John chapter 21. Peter says, in verse 3, I'm going fishing. Okay? I mean, why on earth would you go fishing after the most important event in all history, the resurrection of Jesus? I'm going fishing. You think about it. You know, if Jesus had stayed dead, you could understand him going fishing, okay? Because, okay, I've, I've just wasted three years of my life following someone I thought was someone, but they ended up not to be someone because they're dead. I'm going back to my career. You can understand him going fishing if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead. But Jesus had risen from the dead. Why on earth did you go fishing? And if you think about it, here's what I think happens. I think Peter was so aware of his failing. He had lost hope. You know, he replayed the video in his mind of his denial. I don't know Jesus. When it counted most, he denied he even knew Jesus. He probably thought he was permanently disqualified. And the point was this. Yeah, Jesus was alive, but he probably doesn't want much to do with me. And I think that's where Peter was at. And it might be that's where you're at. Hey, Jesus is alive, but he might not want much to do with me. Uh, there was a story of... Uh, a dam that was being constructed. A valley was about to be flooded and a dam was about to, uh, it was under construction and they, it was within months of the valley being flooded. And there was a village in that valley and all the people in the village were to be relocated to new homes uh, before the dam was finally finished. But in the months leading up to the finishing of the construction of the dam, you know, the village didn't have a future. And people started noticing that, you know, People weren't cutting their grass anymore. The litter was just being left strewn around. If something, if there was a damaged roof, they didn't repair the roof anymore. People weren't doing painting their fences. Uh, the place was starting to become a bit dishevelled because people knew that, well, it's not going to be long before this village is underwater. And one of the villagers made a wise comment about this, and they said, uh, where there is no hope for the future, there is no power in the present. And it's absolutely true. They saw no future. So they had no power in the present. And I think that's where Peter was at. And I think that's maybe where some of you are at. You think, hey, Jesus is alive. Yeah. 
but he probably doesn't want much to do with me because you're so aware, like Peter, of your failings. You ever get deja vu moments? You know, you think, oh, I've been here before. I've, I remember this somehow. Well, Peter had two deja vu moments on that morning when he went fishing. Um, what happened next? Well, Jesus appears on the shore. He tells him to cast his net again. They'd caught nothing all night. They'd been fishing and caught nothing. Notice the pattern. They weren't very good fishermen. They'd caught nothing all night. And Jesus told them to cast the net. And they caught this miraculous catch of fish. Just like three years before at the beginning. And Peter realized this is Jesus. And he swam to the shore. And when he got to the shore, this is where he... So this is first deja vu moment. Fishing, caught nothing, miraculous catch. Swims to the shore. And then he has a second deja vu moment. Because on the shore, the Bible says... It records in John chapter 21, verse 9, when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooked over a charcoal fire and some bread. Here's a second deja vu moment, the charcoal fire. In fact, there's only two times charcoal fire is mentioned in the New Testament. The time before this time was the evening when Jesus was betrayed and Peter, it says, he went to warm himself around a charcoal fire. The scene of his denial. So here he is at a charcoal fire again. Sometimes smells evoke memories, yeah? I mean, I remember my daughter when she was very little. She's 21 now. When she was little, she loved Pity for Lou yogurt. You know, the little, oh, very nice creamy yogurt. She loved the Pity for Lou yogurt. And I did too, to be honest. So I'd give her a spoon and me a spoon and her a spoon. Anyway, I remember one time she'd had so much Pity for Lou yogurt, it just all came back up again. Now all of a sudden, Pity for Lou yogurt was was slightly tainted in it. Oh, it had a horrible smell. <laughs> it smelled absolutely awful. And any time I get a whiff of Pity for Lou yogurt, it gives me that flashback, all right? It's like a deja vu. Sweat smells evoke memory. Well, I think Peter would have smelt the charcoal fire and he would remember the last time I smelt a charcoal fire was when I made the, great, the greatest mistake of my life. I denied that I even knew Jesus. And here he is again at a charcoal fire. And this time he has a different opportunity. This is what the conversation with Jesus goes like. John 21, verse 15. After breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus had asked the question the third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Isn't this fantastic? Here Peter had three denials at a charcoal fire. And Jesus, he gives him the opportunity to have three affirmations of his love at the same charcoal fire. Someone once said, oh, when my wife gets angry, she gets historical. And his friend said, you mean hysterical? He said, no, no, I mean historical. She reminds me of all the times when I've made the mistake before in the past. Well, uh, thank God he's not like that. He doesn't go back and say, you denied me, you denied me, you denied me. He said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? You see, he's the God of the second chance. And he's the God of the third chance. And he's the God of the fourth chance. And he's the God of the fifth chance. And he's the God of the sixth chance. In fact, I think Peter would have remembered back to an interaction that he had with Jesus years before in, 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 during Jesus' ministry. He asked Jesus the question in Matthew 18. Uh, Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. <laughs> and I think Peter thought he was being generous. Seven times, do you think? Give him seven new chances. Um, and Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. You see, Peter was looking at human standards. But Jesus was revealing exactly how the Father, how God forgives us. And it's not like he's saying, okay, 70 times 7, that's 490. So you do 491 mistakes and you're out. I don't think he was saying that. I think he was saying, who's counting? I think he was saying, my forgiveness is so massive. There is not a number that you can of sins you can commit that tips it over the edge. I love that. There was a, a famous Russian general whose son... Uh, this is centuries ago. His son was put in charge of a garrison of soldiers. He was promoted to this post because of his father. And he had this opportunity. And all of a sudden, the first time in his life, he had money. He had a good income. And he had responsibility and he was free. And so he started gambling. 
And before he knew it, the gambling got better of him. And before he knew it, he was gambling everything that he earned and he was now in debt. And then he starts dipping into the army's money to feed his gambling habit. And he starts racking up debts against the military. And then the news comes, and it's dreadful news, that there will be an audit of the accounts. And he knows, he, he knows he's in trouble. He knows he's going to be exposed. And so that night, he can't face the exposure. He can't face the humiliation. And so that night, he gets strong spirits, and he starts drinking in his office, building up the courage to end his life. He has a revolver at his one hand. He has the spirits in the other hand. And in front of him are the accounts showing the huge gaps where he's taken money for his gambling habit. And he gets a pen and he writes on the accounts, who can pay such a debt? And he keeps drinking and drinking, end, planning to end his life. But he actually ends up drinking so much he ends up falling asleep. And he falls asleep on the accounts. And that night, Nicholas I is passing through town and he decides, I'm going to visit my friend's son who's in charge of the garrison here. And that night, as he walks into his office, he sees the scene. He sees his friend's son, he sees the strong spirits, he sees he's sleeping drunk. And he sees the revolver at his hand and he sees the accounts and he can see from the accounts that he has amassed huge debts. And he sees the question, who can pay such a debt? And Nicholas I picks up the same pen and writes across the account, Nicholas I can. And the good news about Easter is this, and I think Peter was, it was dawning in Peter, the, Easter, the resurrection wasn't just to impress us. I mean, it was impressive, but it wasn't just to make us go, wow. It was to affirm something had happened on the cross that makes it possible for sinners like you and me to have our sins permanently wiped out. He died as our substitute. His blood cleanses our sin and the resurrection affirms the truth of it. It works. You trust in Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You turn from sin and trust in him, your life is changed. The resurrection affirms this. I love this. And that's why Peter had hope. His hope's not based on a oh yeah, maybe God will like me, or maybe I'm going to make it through tomorrow. He writes to believers who are about to face the worst persecution of their lives, and he says, you can have a living hope based on the resurrection. And for Peter, it was the lifeline he had experienced, and he knew it was for everyone. And he goes on in the verse, and he says, in his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. This is an inheritance. It's not only just a hope in this life. It's that there's an internal inheritance kept in heaven for you and I. And it won't spoil, perish, or fade. Uh, there's a story of an old man. He had bad hearing. And uh, unknown to his family, his, his family had to shout very loudly for him to hear. But unknown to his family, one day he got himself signed in at a local um, hearing clinic. And he got new hearing aids fitted. And it, oh, what a difference. I mean, just incredible. Chalk and cheese, he could hear everything. Anyway, a month later, he went back for the checkup and the hearing specialist said, this is amazing, your hearing has improved 100%. He said, your family must find this amazing. And he said, oh, I haven't told them yet. <laughs> he said, and the, the, doc, the, 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 the hearing specialist said, you, you're kidding me? He said, no, no, uh, I haven't told them. I just sit around and listen to all their conversations. He said, for the last month, I've changed my will three times. <laughs> Do you know, the good news with God is that God doesn't change his will. When he gives us an inheritance, he doesn't change it based on, all right, you haven't performed as well this month. You see, when God accepts you, he accepts every version of you there ever will be. When Jesus accepted the, Jesus, the Peter who fell at his knees and said, away from me, I'm a sinful man, he did that with the full knowledge of the man he would become and the man he would end up being towards the end. God accepts you because not just because of what you he doesn't accept you because of what you've done he accepts you because of you because of your faith in Jesus because of what Jesus did for you and you trust in him and he accepts every version there will be of you God accepted the 15 year old version of Peter Anderson when I trusted him for the first time God today accepts the 47 year old version of me based on that same cross that same resurrection he is my still my hope and God has already accepted if I get to live this long the 70 year grumpy version old of me <laughs> that I haven't even met yet, he already accepted because it's an eternal price because he's God and that cross and resurrection affirms our salvation. The resurrection is the basis for our hope. We don't need to be irrational optimists. We get to be rational optimists based on the historical fact of the resurrection. 
Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the resurrection. Jesus, thank you you conquered death. Thank you you're alive right now. And thank you through your death and resurrection. Peters, people who feel like they're failures, people who know they don't always measure up, can experience eternal acceptance. And Lord, we're so grateful. We're so grateful. Thank you for the account of Peter. Thank you for his writing to people facing the challenges. We might be facing challenges. No matter what we're facing, thank you that we can have this eternal optimism based on an historical fact, the resurrection of Jesus. So I pray, fuel that faith today. For those who feel Jesus might be alive, but he probably doesn't want much to do with me. For those who feel that right now, I ask that they would be impacted by your love, which is so great that it will accept them no matter who they are or what they've done. So just come to God just now, just in your own words, in your own way, just you come to God. He's here right now, he's, his presence is here, Jesus is alive, his spirit is with you, and right now put your faith in him, thank him for the cross and the resurrection. Maybe you're so aware of your failings, maybe you're hugely aware of your regrets, you wish you could turn back time but you can't. You feel that you've lost hope, you feel that God would want nothing to do with you. I want to tell you that God wants everything to do with you. And the whole reason for the cross and the resurrection is that we aren't good enough. And that needed to happen for us. So call out to him just now. Let him be your saviour. In fact, if you want to make that decision, you want to trust in Jesus, why not pray this prayer with me just now? Say, dear Lord God, I'm so grateful for the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the price for all my sins so I can be forgiven and have a new life. Thank you, in the third day you rose again. Thank you, you're alive right now. Jesus, be Lord of my life from now on. Take first place. Forgive my sins. Give me a new start. Thank you for this living hope. I now face the future with you, God. Take first place in my life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we would love to hear from you. God has heard you. God saves you. God rescues you. We would love to hear from you. Please let us know you've made that decision so that we can help you grow in your faith. God bless.